Hi. Am I on? It's, just, it's working. Hi. Hi, everybody. Good to be back uh, <clears throat> on this stage. Uh, and I want to just, as always, say a word of thanks. Uh, conferences like this just don't <clears throat> happen by themselves. Uh, Alex is a marvel. He's got a very busy full-time job. Try getting him on the phone uh, and getting him to call you back the same week. It's a, you deserve an Asprey box just for that. Uh, but he managed to find a way to do all that and to put this conference together. And uh, the st some of the staffers who were working with him left for other jobs over the summer. And he, somehow or other, managed to do all this with a wife and two little guys at home. So Alex, thank you for all of us for putting this together. And is, is, is Mano Lal still here? Mano, you still, yeah. Mano Lal, um, Mano, a great professor here at Columbia University. Thank you so much. Uh, this sometimes is academic conferences that folks like you understand, but folks like many of me don't understand, but uh, you've managed to blend uh, the, the common sense with the academic. And I really thank you so much, Mano, year after year for doing this as well. Okay, so let me start with a, a non-water question, if I may, okay? So a few years ago, being chief science officer of anything was like a really exciting, big deal kind of thing. It was not controversial. You were the authority. You were the voice people would turn to. And somehow or another, science became, everything became politicized. So a phrase like trust the science suddenly instead of being what sounds like common sense to me, suddenly became uh, a source of controversy. So I'm just curious, given the fact that you're both scientists, and we'll talk about what you do in the course of this next half hour, if you could talk a little bit about whether or not the, I'll call it the controversy, the politicization over authority, over science, has transformed in any way the way you develop what you do, the way you speak to your publics, the way you speak to Congress, the way you speak to regulators. Is this changed, has this controversy changed the way you think about things and the way you present things? More presenting than thinking about things, I suspect. Uh, what, Sarah, why don't you start? Sarah was here last year, by the way, except she was on a panel, if I remember correctly, we were a panel like of six or seven people last year, is that right? And, yeah, and I kept, the and I kept thinking, federal government. And I, and I kept thinking to myself, we should give her more airtime. So here we are, this year, this year get more airtime. <laughs> yeah, um, so, for, so for us, for NOAA, um, we have six different line offices, one of which is the National Weather Service. And so we have offices in every single state, territory. We even have an office in Antarctica. And we are in the communities. And so for us, that authoritative information, particularly from the National Weather Service, means life and death. Our mission is protecting lives, property, livelihood. So we have to give people information on if a storm is coming or understanding right before. And they have to trust us to act. Otherwise, evacuation orders don't happen and people die. And so for us, there are aspects of our science that no matter what, it is trusted. And we have the discussions. And we're working in the communities with emergency managers to act. The harder part, what you're getting to, is on some of those longer time frames where we have science and information that if you make decisions today, you don't have to deal with some pain later on. Or you can reduce the cost of things. And that. Um, is requiring the science to now help understand and work with, sh with our decision makers, with our stakeholders, to understand how to make that science actionable. And I think that's the biggest change that we have, and it's part of the reason I was brought back in as chief scientist, because I am a climate scientist by training, a scientist at NOAA for 10 years, but I've also spent time at two different uh, big banks. I've spent time in the private sector. We'll, we'll talk about that. But so from that, it's trying to make sure that we're translating the science into actual information that is needed. And I think that is the hardest thing right now. But it's also a really amazing opportunity that we can bring the science to the table and say, you know, these are your, this is the science and what it tells us. And then these are the different ways that it has the impacts. And then the decision makers get to make the decisions off that. Shavanda, how about you? Yeah, so... Oh, wait, both of you are doctors, so if you don't mind, I'm using first names. I'm being very familiar here. I hope no, no offense, I hope, is, is intended, and I hope no one, no one takes any offense. You actually pronounced it correctly, so that's, a, so, <laughs> so that's the first start, and so that's... Well, we, we, love that's your mom, we love your mom, so, but I'm sure there were plenty <laughs> of days where you had to correct somebody on the pronunciation. Maybe today. <laughs> <laughs> so, so um, 
I will just share with you that I've been a, a federal scientist for 22 years. And so just recently a Senate confirmed political appointee. Um, and so I've seen the, the ebb and flow of science um, interest across, you know, around the world, actually. And so as a federal scientist, you know, the Department of Agriculture touches every one of us every day because we all need to eat. And one of the things that we have the luxury of in this country, we trust that our food is safe. You don't walk into a grocery store and start wondering if there's going to be any food on the shelves, if it's going to be safe, you know, has it been um, inspected, regulated, um, an environment. We play a huge role in that space, too. And, and so what I think you're referring to is climate, our, 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 some of our science around climate which for me, having been a part of many different administrations, as a, as a federal executive, I work for, it doesn't matter which party's in, in, in power. I, we, work, we work for all of them. And the beauty of being about being in science is we try to stay, we stay right down the, stay right down the line, um, apolitical, because our science matters. If you can't trust the science from the federal government, um, and our scientists, who can you trust? And so we're working really hard for that. Um, Many years ago, uh, we, we conducted an uh, um, exercise around government, around scientific integrity. And so each one of the federal agencies had to um, produce a scientific integrity policy. And so in USDA, I had the luxury of leading the team to develop that scientific integrity policy and also to develop the training. And then when um, President Biden became president again, we, that, that effort was re-upped. Because it's important as chief scientists that we ensure that the science is unadulterated. And so that there is some high level of integrity around the work that we do. And, and sometimes that's easier than others. Uh, one of the things that I'm excited about is that in agriculture, we continue to do our climate science every day, every day, every day. I don't care what you call it. You know, call a rose, any other name, it's still a rose. You guys know all of that. Um, we were able to continue to do that because we still got to grow food for people. We still have to protect the environment. And so now that we have huge investments from the administration and Congress, we're ready because we never stopped doing the important research that was necessary to have make sure that we were prepared for what faces Sarah, us. it looks like you want today to add a word. Yeah, I was going to add that for the business people in the room, one of the ways I think about scientific integrity, too, to, translated in, is it's our branding or it's our reputation risk. And so for us, building our brand, building the expectation that you can trust the science that we're putting out is so critical so people use it. And it's once it's lost, it's really hard to get back. So we work so tirelessly. It's, all, it's a part of every chief scientist portfolio is scientific integrity and making sure we have the policies that are in place to make sure that we have the highest integrity, but then also that in our communications and all the work that it is coming through because we want to make sure that people continue to trust in the science that we are producing and the guidance that we get. And that includes if you have holding our scientists to the highest levels of expectation and accountability. And sometimes that's really, really tough because if one scientist can call into the question all of the work that we're doing, we cannot allow that to happen. So that scientific integrity goes both ways, top, down, bottom up. Everybody needs to be held accountable for the integrity of our work. When lay people like me think of, <clears throat> think of the federal government, we think of it as a vast bureaucracy, oh. somewhat siloed. Mm -hmm. I'm not using siloed as an ag term, so <laughs> just a business term. Uh, somewhat siloed. And, um, and, you know, for, for crazy historical reasons, NOAA is part of the Department of Commerce instead of the Department of Interior. I mean, it's a... It's a, it's a it was a fight during it's, the Nixon it's, it's administration. A, it's a, it's a, it's, if those of you who don't know the story, very briefly, it was a grudge President Nixon had against the then Secretary of the Interior. I think his name was Hickel. Is that right? And, uh, and Hickel came out saying that Nixon should pay more attention to the Vietnam War demonstrators. And, uh, he was, and they were about to put... Noah into interior, but he was so annoyed that he decided, I'm not giving Hickel one more, one more piece of influence in the government. So he put it into, into commerce. But, but be that as it may, whichever department it's in or whatever, whatever agency it's part of, when we think of the federal government, we think of something very siloed. And you, know, you, you, you report into different Senate and House committees and in the testimonies that you give and so forth. To what extent is there a, a cross-matrixed opportunity for 
the chief scientists, I, I know from your staffs that you guys are friends and that you've worked together on stuff, but could you give us some assurance to make us feel, feel good about our government, those who are Americans here, can you make us feel good about our government the way the two of you actually, you know, do things together? In the movies, you'd be death rivals in a cage match or something like that, but, but could you talk about the way that you guys actually work together to the benefit of us all? Could you talk about some of the ways that in your very different fields you actually find ways of working together? Absolutely. So you're, this conference is about water. Water, there's a, system, a systematic approach to, ch to solving a lot of the challenges we face. And water for us, for feeding America and feeding the world, is just one of those, one part of that. So we can't afford to work in silos. Um, I can't afford not to work with Sarah. I, I, we use Sarah's uh, satellites. <laughs> So a lot of the data, when we do precision agriculture, when we're working with the farmers to be able to have data-driven processes and environmentally friendly processes, how to you know, get the most for every drop of water they use, a lot of that information comes from the satellites that I don't have to purchase and I don't need to purchase because my colleagues at NOAA have purchased the satellites and they're operating them, they're making them available to us. Our colleagues at NASA are doing the same things. So a lot of the challenges that we face, especially around climate and environment, we, we could not afford not to work together. I spent two years at the White House in the Office of Science and Technology Policy. And a part of that office is the National Science and Technology Council that brings together scientists and experts from across the federal government. So we have a lot of interagency um, coll collaborations, coordinations, and most importantly, sharing of resources because it does not make sense to duplicate efforts when we work together. And so this topic today is one of those topics where it makes great sense for us to be on this stage together. Yeah, and on a critical topic of drought, we actually got USDA and NOAA together back in February, March, and we held a multi-day conference of what is the future of drought in a changing climate? And we had our NIDIS, which is the National Integrated Drought Information System from NOAA, which is all the information on drought. That's where you know where drought is happening in the country and also expectations in the coming months for how drought will unfold, which is really important for planting. And we also had the USDA climate hubs there as well. And so we had our regional coordinators. Then we brought in NASA, Bureau of Reclamation, Interior, um, CDC, health course, everyone to have this discussion of what is the future of drought, both on our regulation, the data that we're putting out, like what is the key data that we're putting out, how might it evolve, but then also how do we need to start doing R&D fundamental to the changing climate? And then also, how do we communicate that so everyone can use it um, from the water managers, from USDA, from health as well? And so bringing that group all together um, was done by NOAA and uh, USDA together. That report will come out in the next couple of months of what the key recommendations are. But there are multiple touch points with different agencies that we have where we, we have our scientific expertise, they have their scientific expertise, and we need to combine them to be able to guide the country forward. And Seth, I want to just add real quickly, I think there's one big effort. The president in his first week in office signed an executive order around environmental justice and, and, and climate change. And in, across the entire federal government, we are working to ensure that there is environmental justice in everything that we do. And climate is one of those large spaces where we have an initiative called Justice 40, where 40% 40 of the efforts that we spend around climate and clean energy really needs to be focused on those underserved communities that have been left behind. And so one agency can't do it alone, so we are all working across government. So it's just one example of something that's very relevant to you all about water. You know, every, every person deserves to live in a healthy environment, a healthy community with drinking water, with portable water, you know, and so that's not the case today. And so there have been some communities left behind, and we're working together across government to try to address that challenge. By the way, just on that, I, I, for those of you who apply for federal grants at all, if it's, it's a core part of what I've been doing lately, uh, last year or so, is it's, I've been very moved by the degree to which USDA grants always ask the question about to what extent what we're doing affects underserved communities and historically underserved communities. It's really very moving to the idea, you know, it's a, it's a great country, uh, but not necessarily for everybody. And it's a way to, it's a way to, it's a, it's a way, to, yeah, I, I mean, it, it, you can see, you can see not just, it's not sort of an afterthought. It's not sort of a, a, a toss in. I, I really have been very moved by that. I want to just, um, 
Sarah, you're kind of a big shot in an agency which, uh, according to your mission, your, your agency, your department, uh, an agency, actually agency mission statement, you call it an agency that enriches life through science. Now, you think I'm going to ask you a question, but I'm not. It's Siobhan that's getting a question. So, so, get, so don't be daydreaming here. You, you pay attention now. So she works at a place. She's the chief scientist at a place that says that science is supreme. You're at a place that, I, searching the website, searching through your documents, science is there, but it's not front and center in that. And I'm wondering to what extent science ends up becoming a core area for you. In other words, are, are you in the Secretary Vilsack, I believe, right? Secretary Vilsack, uh, you know, to what extent are, is, is it integrated as deeply into what you are doing as Secretary, let's say, Raimondo is doing? That's a great question. And well, I that's what I'm here for. <laughs> Thank you, Seth. <laughs> so, you know, the U.S. Department of Agriculture is a science-based organization. It really is a science-based organization. And um, one of the things that we've seen for the very first time in the strategic the strategic plan for the department is this, that science was made front and center as a part of the strategic plan. And it's in, embedded in every goal. As a matter of fact, it's a cross-cutting goal because we recognize that science and data and information are the only ways we're going to be able to move forward with the challenges we have before us. We recently, um, in May, released the... Um, USDA Science and Research Strategy, and the Secretary announced that at the Aim for Climate Summit in Washington, D.C. I'm, I'm extremely fortunate. Like I said, I've worked for a lot of administrations, and I've been in government 22 years. Um, I have had a wonderful opportunity with President Biden and Secretary Vilsack. For example, we've invested over $18 billion in climate science. And um, so the, we're putting our money where our mouths are, right? So we're seeing a demonstration on how important science is. How do we advance um, an agriculture enterprise? I'm going to use ag because that's where I'm from. That is uh, beneficial to all, not some. Um, we're in a country where at a time we have record farm income, that that income and those attractive benefits of that have only been experienced by less than 10% of the farms in America. And if you know a lot about rural communities, you know that you know we only have 2% of our population involved in farming. The only way we can produce enough food that allows us to sit in this room and have this conversation is because of science and innovation. We've been able to create an ag enterprise that is productive, uh, we're working on sustainability and resilience. And most importantly, we have to make it profitable. And so that's where science and innovation come into play. And that's why I believe the president and, and the secretary and Congress, because it wouldn't be possible if Congress did not uh, appropriate the dollars, believe that science and investments in ag research are really important. Yeah, we're going to come back and explore that in a minute. I want to throw a question at Sarah, though. And, and that is, uh, you, you referenced uh, in your very first answer the fact that you had worked in the private sector, and I think I'm allowed to say, because I think it's on, on some of your public documents, that you worked at Goldman Sachs, and you worked at J.P. Morgan, and maybe at other financial institutions as well. So you come at this at a slightly different perspective than many other people, and I'm curious to know, with extreme weather events like floods and droughts becoming more common and much more costly, I'm wondering to what extent you have advice for us here and generally for what we should be thinking about, preparing for, and doing to get ready for what is a, sort of a choppy period ahead of us vis-a-vis -vis water in particular. If you could help us think that through. What should, what should investors be thinking about? What should farmers be thinking about? What should the general public be thinking about? Yeah. So, so my discussions with CEOs and also with investors thinking about this, there's two ways that people are mainly thinking about it in terms of their operational sustainability. So when events are starting to unfold or you expect events or you have an event, you can do advanced planning for once that event happens, how do you deal with it to reduce the impacts as much as possible? Um, and we work with emergency managers and with uh, local communities and states to be able to do those types of plans, giving them that information of, um, you know, we can actually predict uh, droughts, extreme heat, uh, extreme amount of water. We actually have some knowledge of that a couple months in advance um, through our seasonal outlooks that we produce operationally. And so you can have some advanced knowledge of that a couple months in advance, and then you have the advanced warning of the weather forecast. So you can plan for it at those different timescales. Then there's investment that is taking place in much further in advance of expectations of these exchanging extremes. And with that work, it is 
quantifying what your risk is today, not just using historical information. I actually just came from insurance companies for discussions about the future of insurance. So it's not just using historical information, it's also using these new modeling, new types of information to understand how the risks are evolving. So what your risk is today is actually not reflected just in the historic data. You need all that information. And then also what it might be in the future. And then making those smart investments to be able to handle those changes, but also handle new types of information and the science evolving in time. And so it's you're making investment decisions under uncertainty now about the climate, but also expectations for potentially reduced uncertainty over the coming years or decades to be able to deal with that. So you're making smart investment to allow for further retrofitting or further adaptation years down the line versus potentially planning to build something to handle 2100 climate when that is so far outside and many things can happen in advance of that. Um, and then with all of this, I think it's bringing climate information into this and the various ways that it could affect your business. And I think people are just starting to understand that, how they might do it in every sector. And some sectors have you know, leapfrogged much further ahead than others based on experiences they have. But no matter where you are in the world, not just in the United States, you are experiencing climate change of some sort, first through heat, then through extreme precipitation changes, changes in droughts, changes in sea level rise are the big ones that people are experiencing right now. Okay, so I'll, I'll build off of that and circle back to what I'd said we come back to you with. So you are, you are a, not an ivory tower science, you are a hands-on science because you have to, it's where the rubber meets the road, the farmer has to make use of the wisdom that you help bring to them. So can you talk to us a little bit about, um, especially now with depleting aquifers, with reduced river flows, climate change demanding as much or probably more water for irrigation. We're seeing reports of, of places that had been rain fed that now need supplemental irrigation. Could you talk a little bit about the scope of this problem that we're gonna be seeing, which could put more strain on our water resources and to the extent that the good news part of the answer, if you don't mind me pushing you a little bit on that, is what are the, some of the technologies that you're seeing that get you to think, okay, it's bad, but it's not miserable? So thank you for that question. And Seth, I, I saw a little bit of your bio. I want to share with you that I served on the BARD for many years oh. up until I was Senate confirmed last year. I had to step wow. down. But BARD is our the bi Binational Agriculture Research and Development collaboration between the United States and Israel. So yep. for many years, I've been traveling to Israel, and we've been partnering with uh, the scientists over there on how to grow food, grow produce, grow vegetables, and they are extremely successful at it. I have traveled to fields where the dirt is so dry that you can see the fissures in it. But every drop is going exactly where it's supposed to go, and you'll see the most beautiful tomatoes growing in what appears to be a desert. Yeah. And so um, our colleagues in Israel have figured it out. They figured out how to grow fruit and vegetables when you get very little water. Well, so fast forward to California and a huge drought we were having in California. So what do we do? We called our colleagues in Israel and brought them over to California to talk with our scientists and others about some of the things, the best lessons learned. So, it's, so drought is a big concern, but there's also deluge of water. So now you've come to a time where you're getting floods as well. And so the question is, how do we be more resilient? In, in agriculture so that our food systems will be secure. And so we're doing a couple of, I would say very neat things and it's neat, but we've been doing it for a long time, plant breeding. For example, we're growing plants in places that they have never been grown before, and that's because of science. And, and things like um, DNA markers, going in and finding the proper traits that we would like to be able to input back into a plant to grow in a specific place under specific conditions. High heat, high drought, deluge of water, high salinity. So we're able to be able to go back into the laboratory to our germplasm collection and find those traits that we need to put back into a plant to grow. So that's one thing, starting way at the basic science side of things. And then we're talking about irrigation technologies. 
and being able to have smart water systems. And some systems, I was reading a little bit about this, where we, we go completely and we take all the nitrogen out. We, we just, we really treat it to the max, regardless of where it's gonna have its end use. Well, if the end use is on the field, perhaps it doesn't need to be cleaned to that level. But having smart water approaches, and then having predictive systems, which Sarah already talked a little bit about. In California, looking at snow melt, being able to tell the farmers and producers how much water they can expect. Um, looking at um, grazing land, being able to cast how much uh, grass that a rancher can afford to be able to use in the next year. So those tools are all dependent on science, technology, and innovation. And one thing we haven't talked a little bit about is artificial intelligence, machine learning. And let's back all the way back up in broadband access. So you'll see the Department of Agriculture and some of our other agencies investing largely in broadband access. Because if we cannot connect communities to the broadband, to the internet, it's hard for us to impart smart tools to help, regardless if you're running a water management system or a farm. We have to be able to connect those communities to the internet. So I'll stop there and, and give my, my By the way, that's a very, actually, to me, that's an inspiring answer. The digital divide, as sometimes it's called in this country, is I think of it as a core civil rights issue. And I don't mean necessarily by, by, by race. By right, no. It, it's, it's, you know, poor, poor Community communities type, cannot, yeah. cannot possibly be on equal footing if they cannot get access to internet, to broadband, and so forth. I want to ask you a quick question. Please. You probably travel around the world. You do too, Sarah. I, ha I, I, I have a passport. I've been, I've been in, I've been in the, the, the bush in Uganda. And there are people on cell phones. <laughs> I mean, people are connected. They're, you, you know, they're finding ways to connect. And in the United States, this investment that we're making in the infrastructure for this country is so critically important. To address that digital divide, we have people in America who still cannot access broadband. So I, 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 in, in my first water book, Let There Be Water, I, I interviewed the uh, president of Uganda, and, and I interviewed a woman who, by coincidence, is Israeli, who has developed a whole lifetime of serving Uganda to bring agriculture there. And in the interview, one of them said, people may not have shoes, but everybody has a cell phone. <laughs> and she says, and the community may not even have easy water, you know, to get, but everybody has a cell tower. So, uh, so it's really very interesting the degree to which those societies have prioritized the flow of information in a way that we have not. I mean, it's a little bit off the water topic, but, but, it, but, but for sure we can't possibly get to where we want to get to until that's a basic human right, uh, almost a constitutional right uh, for all Americans. Tell me, just tell me, are we okay on time? Because I know we started a little late. I could take a few more minutes? Okay. Thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, Sarah, did you want to just say yeah, a word on that? I was going to say, it's just fundamental to getting access to all the great science that we have. If you don't have the broadband access, you can't have the smart agriculture information of what is your drought expected? When is rain going to come? What is the expectations in the coming months? What is that satellite tower, satellite telling you about drought in your area? So if you need to apply or not. And so as that increases in the access of smart agricultural techniques increases. We've also been at NOAA investing heavily in subseasonal to seasonal prediction. So being able to predict things three weeks, four weeks, out all the way to multi-seasons out to two years. And so with that information, we do have some predictability and we're advancing it. And parts of the ways we're advancing it is through increase connecting all of that data that we have on the ground, the sensors, the satellite data, but also we have gliders out in the ocean. We have thousands of them collecting temperature salinity as they're gliding around autonomously through the ocean. But that information is really critical for actually how we make those predictions about is, will a drought extend over the next couple months? Will it be hot? What is happening with El Nino that we have developing right now? That all comes from a lot of that information from the ocean. So we're investing in all of those things to put that together to create those seasonal predictions, which then helps you understand what should you do for plantings? What should you expect for the conditions in the coming months, which matter so much in the United States? And then we're also doing that around the world through UN Early Warning for All. It's truly a global benefit. Okay, we have just a few minutes left. So let me, let me do a couple of good news, a couple of bad news type questions so we scare the audience and we excite the audience and so forth. Okay, <laughs> no, I won't scare you, I promise. No funny faces. Okay, so there's been, uh, the New York Times, I'm sure you both saw the articles the last two weeks or so, a couple of different articles about America's depleting aquifers. And, um, you know, I, I, my other book, uh, Troubled Water, I've written about that as well. But the, um, 
it seems like the problem may be accelerating. Part of it is because of, I will call it dumb ag policy, where farmers are incentivized to be pumping more water than they might be needing or otherwise. But I'm not going to ask you to make a political comment here today, I promise. So if you could, let me make it more scientific-based question then. OK. <laughs> I, I know. You've had a 22-year career. I'm not intending to end it today. <laughs> so, so help us to understand that this is sort of like a headline news story. How, to what extent is the overtax of the aquifers a matter of concern? And do you have a sense of the fact that the policymakers are starting to get ahead of this issue to protect a very bad outcome? Yeah, so the, the, so for everyone, the subsurface aquifers essentially are insurance. When you don't have water falling from the sky, people pump water out from the aquifers. And so those take years, decades, centuries, millennia to replenish. And so around the United States and also around the world, we are, we are removing that water. There's only two U.S. states, California and Arizona, that actually, in addition to surface waters, actually are regulated and trying to have regulation around subsurface waters. And not, not even all well, the state, only certain counties. Right. Yeah. Um, and so some of the work that we're doing is working really closely with California. And the re part of the reason we're focused on subseasonal seasonal prediction is that also, when you have the deluge, when you actually have the flooding and you have a lot of water, you have to move it to the places to try and recharge that, other, particularly in the American West. Otherwise, it just goes out to the ocean. And it's a multi-week, multi multi-month process to get through all that regulation. And so there's a real interest in predicting that months in advance so they can get ahead of it and then plan, pay off the farmers to be able to use the land to recharge the aquifers. And so we've been doing some of these pilot case studies with these different communities around trying to do that and figuring that out and using the information in advance. And that's the question on science right now, is to get more of that information on doing these multi-month predictions so you can do that. I think that as the challenge becomes greater, as you have these waters depleted, there will be more discussion around other aspects of the regulation to be able to either streamline that process or deal with it more. Because we're only at the beginning of starting to see those communities run out of water. And from the equity standpoint, too, um, some of these towns or cities have grown in places where people thought that there was water and they thought that groundwater pumping would, they'd always have the water. And so as they're running out, they're surprised that they're running out. And so this is also the access to the information understanding of groundwater and what that means. And, that, and that's why the science and innovation is so important, because with broadband comes smart tools so that we can be precise in how we treat the agriculture production. Because if, if we know exactly how much water, where we need the water, then we just place it there. You've seen this in Israel. You, so we don't treat the entire production. We treat only where we need it. And that's why the innovation is important. Um, I don't know if, you, if, if you've seen a tractor lately, a combine, which is about $1 million, $2 million. So, but all of them have these data systems on the front. So they're collecting data as they go throughout the fields. And as that data is collected, and we have things like artificial intelligence, machine learning, a producer, he or she can stand out into, in their field, use their variables. They don't need to know what's happening in the background with the algorithms and stuff, but be able to have data-informed decision-making tools to know do I treat today? Don't I treat? Some of it is as simple as having a community that says, I saw a pest here. And so did you see it? Did you see it? And so we're not going to treat just because, just because we always do it prophylactically. We're not going to just continue to do it. We're going to do it when we know that there's an issue. So it's about precision. And that's why innovation is so important to be able to help those producers be able to be productive, profitable, and also great stewards of our environment, including water and soil. Sarah, look who you want to sit. You can feel free. Oh, I was on a random fact, too. I was thinking about we love as you we were talking fact. about that. We love random facts. And by the way, it'll be next year's trivia contest, so definitely pay attention. <laughs> I was going to say, with, we're not going to let Henry win that big box again. We didn't again. talk at all about aquaculture, which is, goes between NOAA and USDA as well. And some of the really interesting ways that we're trying to advance aquaculture also, because of these groundwater just, just for problems. for everybody, fish, fish farms and stuff like that. Fish farms. Yeah. Clams, shrimp, everything. Um, one of the ways that we're trying to innovate now, too, because there's also ocean acidification, which it's harder for the shells to grow, um, is trying to figure out how to use wastewater 
to go directly to the aquaculture to be able to do the fish, with the fish, but also have it at lower salinity le or lower uh, pH levels, so also they thrive. And so that is one of the workarounds now in these environments where we have lower water, if you have aquaculture on land or even near shore, trying to figure out how to use the sewage plants that would otherwise just be dumping the water in, thinking about how it's coming out of the sewage treatment to actually enhance aquaculture. Well, it's part of that circular idea of the circular economy where nothing is waste and everything is an opportunity, but we have to start thinking about things differently, right? The, that's, that's the beauty of the idea of the circular economy, where, we, you, know, for, uh, you know, for 100 plus years, wastewater is seen as a nuisance. And indeed, uh, I, I think it was you said about, the, one of you said about the nitrogen level, I forget which one, but, but, uh, but I mean, think about that. As you treat the waste wa wastewater, it already has a rich repository of nitrogen in it. It could be a great source of agricultural support. It could be an opportunity rather than, rather than uh, a nuisance. Yeah, and so we're spending a couple million dollars from our ocean CDR um, program through IRA to be able to actually look into this about how it can enhance aquaculture. And I was gonna tell you why this is so important. Because our USDA also um, administers 15 feeding programs. So the feeding programs in the United States are administered by the Department of Agriculture. And we have six nutrition centers. And I'm saying that because the guidance that you got, everybody knows what the dietary guidelines are. You've seen the My Plate. You used to have the food pyramid. Well, it encouraged us to eat more seafood. Well, the fact is we import a large portion of our seafood. And so that's why it's important that NOAA and USDA and our other federal colleagues are working together to determine how to create um, larger domestic production of seafood, including shellfish. And so you'll find your, your catfish, your trout, and all of your shellfish. We're trying to make sure we create those markets domestically so that we can encourage the type of healthy eating patterns that we like to see in America. Okay, I'm gonna close with a positive question and a less positive question, okay? One first. Come on, it's a game. <laughs> we got to keep the audience with us, you know? <laughs> okay, here we go. You ready? What scares you? What's over the horizon that most people aren't seeing in the newspaper? What, to use the cliched expression, what keeps you up at night? Help us to understand one, but because of time, just one issue that you think is something that the average Average person, even a well-read audience like this, isn't necessarily aware. You see how I flatter the audience, they'll pay attention. It's a, it's a trick. Well, because we're on a university campus, I'm going to tell you this one. Yesterday, in talking to my boss um, in D.C., uh, in three years, 58% of my executives will be eligible to retire. Oh. Um, when we look across America, most of our farmers, our average age is about 58, 60 years old. So it keeps me up that we're not training enough people who are ready to step into leadership roles. And that's why I think places like Columbia University and all of your institutions are critically important. We need the next level of leaders um, prepared. We can't start tomorrow preparing for tomorrow. We got to start today. Wow. Well, that's not the answer I was expecting. So thank you for, thank you for thanks for surprising me. S Sarah, what, what, what's an issue that... That's a, that's, a, by the way, that's a crucially important manpower question. Yeah, it really is great. It's education and manpower. We're tell, in the same Sarah, place. To, to what, what, what is it, what is it that, that is an issue that most of us have, don't realize is a problem, but is a problem that we should be thinking about? Um, I, I've been thinking about what is the science that we need for tomorrow? What critically do we need to start working on so we have those solutions for the future? And you know, one, of, one of the ones that's under the that we've been focused on recently um, through the Ocean Climate Action Plan that's cross-government um, and is top of mind for NOAA has been, what is the future of food and fisheries under climate change? Because as it gets hotter, as it becomes uh, more acidic, those fish are going to deeper waters and they're also going poleward. And so they're moving away from where the fishermen are. And so that's fundamentally changing where our access to fish is, which around the world, this is an issue because 17% of all protein comes from the sea. Okay, let's end on a positive note, okay? I'm fundamentally a very optimistic person. I think even the most intractable problems, when you're back against the wall, will all f somebody will step forward and figure it out. So are you basically optimistic with, you get to see things that we don't get to see. So am I just a happy idiot? Or, <laughs> or, or, is, or, is it, or am I justified my feeling that 
that, you know, yeah, we've muddled along and politics gums up the works. You don't, you don't have to comment on that, but politics gums up the works and all that stuff. But are you basically optimistic that we have the tools we need to feed our public population, to prepare ourselves for extreme weather events and so forth? Or, or uh, I mean, again, not taking our eye off the ball. I'm not suggesting we get sloppy. But are you basically optimistic that we're on top of the big challenges that are ahead of us? So, so our global population is expected to exceed 9 billion by 2050. That's about 2 billion more miles to feed. We're going to need 70% more food, 30% more water, and 50% more energy. And one could hear that, uh, knowing that today over 700 million people still go to bed without enough to eat around the world. One could hear that and be pessimistic. I am not. I'm optimistic because I think we have the momentum, we have the investment, we have the passion around meeting these challenges. I do believe that we have to jump into action. I think we need to have a little bit more ambition around investing in ag research and science and innovation. And I believe we have the will to do that. I just came from a meeting where people have pledged billions of dollars globally to invest in some of these spaces. We have a huge challenge before us. And I think we're ready to meet it. Sarah, don't bring us down, baby. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I am. I, you know, I get the, the, asked this question all the time when I talk about the science. People get super depressed. I'm like, but we know what's happening. Actually, physics tells us we know what's happening. That's way more than you can expect from the economy. Like, we actually know what is going to happen in the future with. With, because of all the science that we have. And so it's taking that science, as you said, to action. It's taking it to action. Okay, we know these things in the future. We know the uncertainties around them. We can take that information. We can act. And we can act in stages, but we need to start acting and acting more. Because guess what? If we don't act now, there's fewer solutions later on or fewer choices that we'll have. Plus, there's going to be some stresses of global food, global water, potential migration, conflict. Like, we need to act now, and if we push forward, and I'm seeing tremendous amount of investment. I was talking with some venture capitalists on the future of ag and the future of uh, aquaculture this morning and talking about all the different solutions out there. If we continue to act, not only will we have the solutions and be able to deal with the adaptation and resilience that we need, but we'll also be a superpower in the climate solution space. And that is the future of the economy. It is the future, coming from Department of Commerce, it is the future of commerce as a climate economy. And we are very much at the forefront of investing in that in this administration, investing in all the solutions. And in the science parts of your agency, in my science agency, we are really pushing forward on all the things that we need. And so from that, I think the knowledge is giving us a lot of power and giving us a lot of action. So I'm very hopeful. Okay, well, unfortunately we are out of time. I'm enjoying this too much, but uh, I, I got the high five sign. Sh Dr. Shavanda Jacobs-Young, Sarah Kapnick, thank you so much for your insights.